I think one of the biggest values is the fact that we now get a chance to re reflect, to reflect on our experiences with Uncle Kathy, but I think probably even more important to reflect on the lessons that we have gotten from being around Uncle Kathy. And the title of this occasion or this program itself, I think is very fitting because while a lot of people would have seen this public figure, one of the things that absolutely blew me away by Uncle Kathy every single time I engaged with him was what a multi-dimensional character he was. He was human, he was a person, but I think above everything else, he always tried to live by his core values and he stuck to them. In everything that he did, all of these core values that we now have tried to keep alive through this organization, he lived them every single day. They shown through in every single conversation he had, in every single activity that he attended, every single rally, every single march, even at protests. At his advanced age, Uncle Kathy was still going to protest for the things that he felt very strongly about. So I think today, as we discover more about this multidimensional life of Akin Kathy, one of the things that I think we should all think about is what are the lessons that we need to be drawing from this? Without taking up any more of your time, on behalf of the Ahmed Kathrada board, of the foundations board rather, I'd like to welcome and thank you all of you for joining today. And I really think that after today, we'll all be able to get a much deeper understanding of what an incredible character Uncle Kathy was. Thank you. Thanks, Lucky. Thank you so much. One of the five new young board members uh, that have come on board to ensure that, that this foundation um, is, is, is transferred to a set of younger board members in, in, in the years to come uh, who, will, who will continue this legacy work. To introduce the next uh, presentation, I, I want to call Anand Singh, somebody that I think Kathy would have seen as his son. Uh, Anand uh, provided valuable friendship, camaraderie, and support to Kathy uh, right up until the end. Uh, and in particular, Kathy's last visit to Budapest, uh, Barbara was saying to me yesterday, is something that will stick with her. And, and I'm sure it is something that he uh, remembered uh, uh, up until up until the end. Anand, thank you so much for doing that interview. We had no sense of what it would be used for at the time, but today we will play short excerpts from it. Uh, and thanks to you and Video Vision for the presentation. Over to you to introduce it. And then Zinzi, let us play the, the presentation as soon as Anand is done. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. Um, it's uh, greetings from early morning in New York, and uh, um, I'm very honored and thrilled to be with you today. Um, for me, it's a very special day because I've spent very, many, many birthdays with Kathy from the time he was released, um, not only in South Africa, but uh, many countries in the world. And he and I built a friendship and uh, and even when I walk here in New York and uh, when he was in New York, we were here together. Um, I can tell you many stories, many funny stories about whether it's ice cream or he didn't have a, a winter coat and it was um, uh, the, mi the middle of winter in New York. And uh, we had made jokes about things all through our lives um, at, until he left us. Uh, but um, Kathy, as um, you will hear and have heard already, was a very special individual. And I think all of us were so fortunate to have him in our lives and be a part of our, uh, our lives. Um, also, um, as we are taking on his birthday and, and dealing with the, um, uh, the values that Kathy represented, um, South Africa once is, is in a sensitive stage. And I think that his uh, ability to uh, be totally open with um, all his colleagues, with adversaries, and be able to engage um, even with Madiba when, uh, you know, he challenged Madiba in, as a young youth leader. And that's how that friendship um, uh, began. And I've been witness to that relationship. So I think, obviously, we need leaders like Kathy 
And I think the legacy of Kathy is what we have and we must uh, look to perpetuate and develop the young leaders that you are already doing at the foundation. Um, you know, as a uh, filmmaker, um, I was probably for the last five years uh, before his death, uh, bugging him to do a one-on-one -on -one interview that I would conduct um, because I was going to ask him very probing questions and, um, and, all, and, and he was kind of reluctant in the beginning. And then finally in 2015, he was in Dur or, Dur or he was coming to Durban and he said to me, okay, well, on this trip, he stayed with me and he said, I'll do the interview. And I was uh, very pleased. And um, what you're gonna see is just segments of that interview which is, I, I don't think uh, uh, it's been seen by anyone before. So I think it's very fitting to have it presented today on his birthday celebration. And, um, and I'm very happy to see that Barbara is on uh, with us. And Barbara, I think a special acknowledgement to you uh, for the role that you have played in making Kathy's life so um, um, enjoyable, especially in the latter years. So. Uh, thank you all. The video can speak for itself. I think he, he you know, he, he didn't dodge any questions like we see many politicians do, you know, he was very open. So uh, let the video roll and thanks everybody for participating. I was uh, lucky enough to be among uh, the real celebrities. I happened to be among them by accident. So I got into the picture that way. Well, as I had to answer this question, it will be arrogant of me to try to advise them. <laughs> I can only speak about our own experiences uh, and you know in our case uh, in my case I mean the discipline already started once I left home at the age of eight to my aunt's place who was a strict disciplinarian uh, although she was overwhelmingly Muslim but still the discipline was there and one had to abide by that a young Kachalia chap, the nephew of Yusuf and Malvi Kachalia, who was with us at school. And after school hours we used to go there. And that's where I met with Yusuf and Malvi Kachalia. And Yusuf took me around as a youngster, took me around to lectures and so forth. And I credit him with my first introduction to even before I joined the Young Communist League. As young people, you get attracted to films and lectures and so forth, particularly films, picnics. So the Young Communist League had this club in Fortsburg. And through the club, at the age of 12, I joined the Young Communist League and got involved in so-called politics at that age. So meeting with people like Walter, Madiba, when I was in Madrid, uh, I met Madiba for the first time because his fellow student was uh, Ismail, Ismail Mir. So they uh, now and then used to come along after lectures, low lectures, and by that time uh, I knew Ismail quite well and subsequently I occupied the very flat uh, when he left, uh, flat 13. But I used to, I got used to visiting Ismail. And uh, then when he came along from law lectures with Madiba, that's when I first met him. And then that must have been sometime in 46 already. Also in the 40s, I won't be surprised if I met him before I met Madiba. Uh, simply because uh, he had a, a little office 
in Commissioner Street. He was uh, an estate agent. But that office happened to be very near Yusuf Kachalia. And it, again, I'm just uh, maybe guessing, but it's through him that I met Walter before I met Madiba. I have always uh, put them in my, what I consider to be my A team. So it's something that one aspires to, but remain my A team. Uh, my divas, Walter, Moses Kotani, Bram Fisher, those are my A team of uh, political leaders. My first experience was the Ghetto Act. You know, in those years you had different laws applying to different groups. So you had this particular uh, thing called the Asiatic Land Tenure and Indian Representation Act, 1946, which applied only to the Indians. And of course, the, by that time, I had already been in the YCL for some years. So that's the time when the, uh, and of course, by 45, 46, the whole leadership of the Indian Congresses changed from a leadership we believed in the politics of negotiation, petitions, deputations, from that to a policy of passive resistance. So that came about in 1945 in Natal 46 in the Transvaal, when the so-called radical leadership under Dr. Naika in Natal, Natal Indian Congress in 45, and Transvaal Indian Congress in 46, where there was a change from the conservative leadership to a radical leadership under the leadership of Dr. Naika and Dr. Dadu. So there was this doctor's pact. Dr. Kuma from the African National Congress, Dr. Naika and Dr. Dadu from the Indian Congress. 1947, they signed the doctor's pact of unity uh, as fellow oppressed people. And that was the foundation of a united front against uh, apartheid laws. Just increasing solidarity. Uh, in South Africa, even the government has, or the ANC has pledged its support, but it needs much more than, than that. But fortunately, I believe that in Europe, there's an increasing movement uh, in support of the Palestinian people, uh, including some Western governments, I believe. I've got my own views which I won't express in public. <laughs> Look, I'm concerned about some of the things. By and large, uh, I think we are doing well, 20 years after democracy. Uh, we are doing well. But unfortunately, there are shortcomings in, at some leadership level. Not, And I can't generalize, and I don't want to start identifying people, but the, there are allegations. Unless, you know, allegations are like corruption and so forth, which are, which are being made. It's unfortunate, but uh, hopefully it's a passing phase that has not disturbed uh, in any radical way our road to, de to a full-fledged democracy. It hasn't, in spite of the negative uh, uh, things that are happening in, and being publicized. I think we are still well on the road uh, to a strong, uh, peaceful democracy. And the policy of the ANC and the policy of the government remains firm. A non-racial, non-sexist, democratic South Africa with emphasis on the neediest of the needy, attending to them. I'd be worried when policy changes, and not to start blaming individuals. Individual, individuals come and go. It's when policy changes that I start worrying. 
Julius Malema has got a lot of quality in him. Uh, I wouldn't condemn him. I, I wouldn't criticize him. I'd say I'd be concerned. I am concerned at some of the methods he's using, which is not necessary in a democratic society. Uh, he's got all the means to express his view and the views of his organizations without causing any disruption in the process. Uh, I'd wish, and as, as I say, I won't condemn him, I'd wish that he'd realize that he is not in the, the only opposition. There are oppositions which are stronger than him. And they are fully utilizing the democratic process. What do you think of Mozi Maimani? No, I think he is uh, a, uh, a, fo a voice that is uh, very, very rational and a voice that should not be just ignored. Uh, I'm not for a moment saying that I'm, I'm not turning against the ruling party, but at the same time, uh, there are instances, uh, for instance, in the Cape, in the Western Cape, where they are in the majority, the, the, the Democratic Alliance, and their voice just can't be ignored. It is a, 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 a one can't now wish, it, wish them away, and one can't just uh, paint them the same paint uh, brush as, as, as all the opposition parties. It's a, it's a party which may have uh, quite a future. I'm not for a moment thinking that within the near future they're going to be so powerful as to, as to but through the electoral process, uh, over, over throw the ANC uh, strength. But I'm not disputing that either, that over the years to come, it may happen. I, but from my own point of view, I don't think it's going to happen in a hurry. Emphasizing their main function, which is to broaden non-racialism. And they are making steady progress reaching out to particularly young people, schools, universities, and so forth. And uh, there is a youth wing. You know, young people, uh, with due respect, uh, have l very little idea of the past, how freedom was arrived at, what was entailed before we got to this thing. So that type of message one, we try to convey the, to the younger people that with freedom comes responsibility to themselves, to their parents, to their country. One can't just dis dismiss weaknesses that one has in one's thinking and in practice. And I need that stability. Uh, which I've got from a person like Barbara. Uh, when one tends to do something wrong, we've always got in mind that as Barbara is there. So that is uh, very, very, I'm blessed with that, that uh, I have her uh, in my life. Do you ever th think about death? Death? Not really. It doesn't. It doesn't occur yet. I fortunately I've been blessed, and I think jail had a part in it. Uh, with good health, I go to for an annual checkup. So nothing has gone worse. It's the usual thing that Indians su uh, suffer from is cholesterol. Mine is within control. Uh, yet the. Uh, Doctors have given me something just to keep it at a low level. Apart from non-racialism, it is the majority of the 
population of this country is young and the future belongs to young people. So with freedom comes responsibility to themselves, to their parents, to their country. Responsibility is on their shoulders to make of South Africa what they themselves want it to be. Successful, healthy, happy country. And that is their responsibility. So while you are taking full advantage of everything that is now opened up, uh, and if you can take full advantage of that, do so. But never forget your responsibilities as young people. And I have no reason to believe that there's going to be any defiance or moving away substantially from the policy of one non-racial, non-sexist, democratic South Africa. Thanks. Okay, I'll have another drink. <laughs>
of the many brave and fiercely permitted women of fortitude. They are all now in another realm, like Comrade Cassie, and also the many current mixed generation of women are continuing in the footsteps of the women of fortitude. I, I first met Comrade Cassie at a fundraising party in a house in Ann Street in Dornfontein, which is here in Johannesburg. And that was during the 50s. And this was a fundraising, which I don't remember who the recipients of that funds was, but I was told it was for a good cause. It was also during my appointment as organizer of the South African Congress, other people's Congress, SAPO. When I started my duties at the headquarters of the Joint Con Con Congress movement uh, that was situated in opposite Market Street, opposite Congress Cassie's flat at Colbert House. And that is where I frequented, that is where I had frequent contact with Congress Cassie and also learn to know him better. His leadership qualities was admirable and he was focus driven and hardworking and untiring. He was also kind and would go, go that extra mile, refusing to put off until tomorrow what can be done today. He was someone that spoke his mind and was unyielding on four principles, which is why he thought deeply about, about the precarious state of our country. And he wrote to the former president to resign. That was the caliber of Comrade Cathy. But working under his guidance as young activists, together with Comrade Mozi Mula, late Comrade Rosie Matthews, Farid Adams, Alan Lambert, Abdullah Jessup, to name a few, was very educated both politically and also administratively. His work ethic was unquestionable. And although he was strict, he was understanding, fair and kind in many respects. And I can recall at the coming towards the end of my first year at the Congress offices where I was, what they call today deployed as it neared to Christmas, I became very emotional and withdrawn because I was longing for my family, knowing that I wouldn't be able to see them during Christmas because those days we were not earning a salary. All of us, we were given money whenever there was money. And Corey Cathy came to me and noticed, as he noticed, he came to me and wanted to know what was worrying me. And I made, I didn't tell him, I made excuses. And the following day, he asked me again. And I burst out crying and telling him that I Long my family is now Christmas and I'm not able to go home because I don't have train fare and so on. So he left me like that 
and later evening, later in the day he came and handed me some money telling me that this is enough money for you and Comrade Rosie because she was also from PE. And the two of you must buy tickets and go home for holidays. So that was his generosity and his kindness and caring nature. Not only to me, but to all those that were in need of one thing or another that they were short of. Omri Cathy's attributes were seen as crucial to the Indian Congress and the Indian Youth Congress. And he served on several senior positions and structures in the Congress movement. He was appointed secretary of the Indian High School, where he assisted the Indian Parents Association to set up the Indian High School in Johannesburg. Uh, when the Indian schools were closed down by the apartheid regime, forcing cho children to attend schools, which was 22 miles away from Johannesburg to Indonesia at the time. You organized Ray Duma Nokwe and Sheila Morrison and Comrade Musaji to teach at the high school. These were comrades who had degrees in education. And they were the ones who taught at the high school in Johannesburg, among other teachers. And he remained the secretary of the high school and I think it was Comrade Eslop and his brother Aziz that attended that school. But Comrade Cathy also had remark remarkable organizing skills and foresight and his foresight was greatly appreciated by the Federation of South African Women especially when a large number of women traveled from their areas and districts of Transvaal around Transvaal and other areas and they descended in Johannesburg unexpectedly on the eve of the 9th of August and made their way to Congress headquarters uh, to continue their journey to Pretoria the following day. Fortunately, the basement of the Congress offices was spacious and all the uh, accommodation was organized for them. Uh, some of the women that couldn't be housed in the basement offices from Belkati made he spread 13 at Corbett House available for some of them to stay the night over. And this he generally did, which was another quality of his caring nature. He was known to give up his bed or his bedroom when comrades came from outlying areas in Transvaal, not having a place to sleep, Colbert House was conveniently centrally situated as they alighted from Park Station, finding it much easier to overnight at Cathy's flat than to take the arduous and sometimes dangerous journey to the townships. And now in the cases, in the case of the unexpected arrival of women, we contacted some of the 
Indian Congress Youth League and directed them to organize and collect blankets and foodstuff from the Indian merchants around the Market Street precinct for the guests and he made sure that they were fed and settled in as comfortable as possible. As in every aspect of our liberation struggle, Comrade Kathy found it necessary in defeating the apartheid state. And so too did he demonstrate that kind of courage and determination with the women protest march, with the women protest and march to the Union buildings against passes. And despite Cathy's banning order, which disallowed him from leaving the magisterial district of Johannesburg, he drove a number of Indian women to Pretoria. And such, such as Comrade Amina Pawad and others due to participate in the protest march. And after they alighted from the vehicle that Comrade Cathy drove, he discreetly stayed to make sure that they were safe to assemble with a large crowd that had gathered at the foot of the Union buildings since dawn. Although he was aware that the special branch was also lurking around the Union buildings, he was careful not to be spotted. So here at this virtual gathering today, we pay tribute to him, and it is only right and proper that we recommit ourselves to an outstanding icon, a patriot, a friend, a comrade, and a leader who displayed throughout his entire life the true values of servant leadership. This indomitable spirit inspires us to assess ourselves and to emulate his life in order to overcome the wretchedness that is before in our country. And as we continue to observe Women's Month, we thank him for his lifelong hard work and immense sacrifice. Long live for Mekethi's undefeatable spirit, long live. Malibongwe, Gama Lama Kosikasi, Malibongwe. And thank you very much. No, thank you, Auntie Sophie. Uh, thank you immensely for your powerful words, for the remembrance and the tribute. Um, we, we, we are so happy that your foundation has taken off uh, and, and we have pledged to collaborate and support it in whatever way is necessary. And, and we hope that at some point, the, the life of, of Sophie Williams, the brain, will see some kind of end product, some book or some publication, uh, because that is a story that needs to be told. Ahmed Kastrada stay in Europe. Uh, 1951 altered his his life in many ways. Um, it, it his first hand experience of the aftermath of the Second World War and of the Holocaust, I, I think, shaped his understanding of what racism could end up in, and and made his determination to fight it much much more greater. Uh, so much so that he cut short his visit there to come back in, to, to, to be part of the 1952 defiance campaign. 
it's not a it's not a part of his life that we, we knew too much about. Uh, fortunately, uh, Dr. Roni Michael uh, from a postdoctoral fellow at the World Holocaust Remembrance Center did some work on this, has written two very useful papers on Kathrada and, and that period, but also um, on, on other aspects of his life on Robben Island um, and, 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 and the work of Anne Frank and his, 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 his relationship with, with that particular book uh, and, 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 and how it shaped his, his kind of understanding of the Holocaust and its impact and, and the issue of sacrifice and, and resistance. We have a recorded uh, presentation from Ronnie, uh, although she is on, online, uh, but is driving at the moment, but sent us this recording. We've also posted the paper uh, in the chat for those of you who want to go through it at some point. Um, but before we start, let me acknowledge Barbara, Barbara Hogan, but also a couple of special friends of the foundation, Kurt Duest in the US, uh, Nadira Umarji in, 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 in Amsterdam, Ismail Hussein in, the, in Australia, the Kathrada family uh, who are here as well. Uh, your, your, your presence means just a huge amount for us here today. Let, let's get the presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon. I would like to open by extending my gratitude for the Ahmed Katrada Foundation for inviting me to participate in this moving event and to apologize for not being there live. My lecture today is based on parts of my PhD dissertation, Remembering the Holocaust in a Racial State, written under the supervision of Professor Louise Bethlehem and Professor Amos Goldberg at Hebrew University of Jerusalem. It focuses on Ahmed Katrada and his evolving perceptions and reflections on the Holocaust during the apartheid years. On the morning of October 15, 1989, Ahmed Katrada was released from Holzmoor Maximum Security Prison near Cape Town. A South African Indian veteran of the anti apartheid struggle, prison trialist, and long serving political prisoner, Katrada had spent 26 years and three months in prison, 18 years of which were on Robben Island. Leaving his prison cell, Katrada carried with him some cardboard boxes containing his most prized belongings. This included 900 carbon, carbon uh, copies of letters he had written and an equivalent number of letters he had received. There were also seven notebooks in which Katrada had secretly recorded inspiring passages he had encountered over the years. In his third notebook, Katrada recorded 13 entries from the diary of Anne Frank, which was smuggled onto Robben Island in the late 60s. On November 2014, I visited the University of Western Cape, Robben Island Mayabuye archives and located uh, Katrada's prison notebooks. Two years later, in 2016, I ran into a Facebook post of the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center to mark International Refugee Day. With a photo of Katrada, I immediately wrote to Tali Nates, uh, the director of the center, and asked for a direct connection to Katrada. It was through Tali and the center's connection with the Ahmed Katrada Foundation that eventually, in August 2016, I had the privilege to interview Ahmed Katrada in his apartment in Johannesburg. While I read Katrada's memoirs several times, it was a true honor to meet him in person and to hear his life story firsthand. Six months later, on March 28, 2017, he passed away at the age of 87, leaving us with a remarkable life story, which continued to enrich the categories through which we imagine social justice. Patrata's interest in the Jewish genocide did not start with the reading of the diary of Anne Frank on Robben Island. 
In fact, his life history included, among other things, a visit he made to the Auschwitz concentration camp and to the Warsaw Ghetto in Poland in 1951. It is through the similarities that Katrada drew between his struggle and the Warsaw Ghetto uprising, and later between his personal imprisonment and Anne's in prison in hiding, that a productive inter interaction between Holocaust memory and his own experiences in apartheid South Africa is revealed. Today, I will give you a short glimpse into his visit to post-war Europe and his encounters between the history of the Holocaust and his own traumatic experiences of racism and apartheid. So, as you all know, Katrada was born on August 21st, 1929 in Trezerenek, a small rural uh, town about 2,040 miles from Johannesburg to a religious Muslim family of Indian descent. And at a time, stereotypes of the Indian merchant uh, uh, as dishonest, crafty and exploited were prevalent in the South African society from the very inception of uh, Indian settlement in the country in 1860. Although anti-Indian legislation had been imposed upon Indians at a regular interval since the late 19th century, the rise of Afrikaner right-wing proto-fascist organizations over the 30s and the 40s provoked violent anti-Indian demonstrations across the country. While Katrada describes his childhood in uh, Shretzerenek as marked by joy, he was eventually forced to leave his own hometown when he was eight years old and moved to Johannesburg as the local segregation determined uh, separate schools for separate races. And as in Shretzerenek, there was a school for whites and a school for black South Africans, but no school for Indians. In 1939, when South African Parliament decided to enter the Second World War on the side of the Allies, it also introduced the Asian Land Tenure and Trading Act, placing further restrictions on Indian residents. This resulted in a new Indian leadership evolving from the left, which was drawn uh, uh, to the Communist Party of South Africa and uh, the Indian South African activist Joseph Dadu uh, was one of the first Indian leaders to join the Communist Party in uh, early 1939. Following Dadu, Kathrada was drawn into the Young Communist League when he was only 12 years old. And uh, by the mid 40s, he was already well invested in communism and was admitted into the South African Communist Party. As Katrada told me in his interview, it was in the party meetings that he uh, first acquired deeper knowledge of Nazi Germany and the ongoing tragedy of European Jewry. The part of the account uh, uh, regarding uh, the fact that uh, in the Communist Party, uh, he heard lectures about Nazism and about the ghettos and the, the Jewish suffering during the Holocaust. It's uh, compatible with the scholarly historiographic uh, portrayal of the Communist Party of South Africa's position on the war. Until June 1941, the South African Communist Party rejected the war, claiming it was an inter-imperialist conflict and focused on building a united front against the war that included the white and black working class. The Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact signed by the Soviets and the Germans in 1939 helped reinforce this stance. However, immediately after Germany's invasion of Soviet, the Soviet Union on June 21st, 1941, the party shifted position and became a staunch defender of human liberty in the face of Nazi terror. Indeed, Katrada testified that the Communist Party's anti-fascist message had a great impact on him, especially in light of the right-wing Afrikaner support for Nazism at the time. Moreover, he asserted that the sites of war he witnessed 10 years later during his European Odyssey reinforced his anti-fascist tendencies. On 14 June 1951, Katrada left South Africa to serve as the head of the Africa Desk at the World Federation of Democratic Youth headquarters in Budapest. 
during his visit abroad, he traveled through the Czech Republic to Germany and Poland, where he witnessed firsthand the destruction left by the Second World War. While there is much to say about Kutwada's visit in Europe, particularly in Germany and Czechoslovakia, uh, due to time restraints, I would like to focus now on his visit to Poland in September 1951. He was invited to participate in the Warsaw meeting of the International Union of Students and travel the city and its surroundings in the weeks prior to the event. It was during that uh, short period that he visited the Warsaw Ghetto and Auschwitz concentration camp. In his memoirs, he reflects on the enormous impact of uh, uh, the sites he had witnessed. And he states, and I quote, when we went to what had been the Warsaw Ghetto, I was reminded of the Nazi atrocities in Czechoslovakia. The Jews who rose up in Warsaw had been crushed as uh, ruthlessly uh, as the villagers of Lidis confined to an area of the city behind a wall 18 kilometers long and almost three meters high, the uh, Jews had been warned by one of the rare escapees from Treblinka that extermination waited at the end of a nightmarish rail journey in closed cattle cars. Led by Mordechai and Levich, the young and the brave rose up against their capture on 19 April 1943. By 8 May, the uprising had been crushed, and rather than uh, be taken prisoner, Anilevich and others took their own life. When I visited the site of this blot on humanity, only a modest monument marked the murder of tens of thousands of Jews and paid tribute to the hundreds who fought back and died. Katara's encounter with the remains of the Warsaw Ghetto in 1951 and his detailed description of the Jewish uprising points to his perception of the Jewish tragedy in, uh, in Europe as a point of inspiration. While Katara's memoirs specifically described the Warsaw Ghetto victim as Jews, he also recognized the non-Jewish victims of Nazi atrocities, aka the uh, Lidis uh, massacre victims, um, whom he positions as central to his recollection of his visit to Prague. And we will not be able to, uh, uh, to elaborate on this one today. Uh, but Katrana points to similarities between the story of the crash resistance of the Warsaw Ghetto uh, Jews and the story of the persecution and massacre of the inhabitants of Lidis. Uh, uh, for him, emphasizing the stories of heroic resistance to the Nazis expresses his universal perception of the cost of the war, although uh, this universal perception depends to a large extent on the particular. By recognizing the, specific, the specifically Jewish identity of the victims of the Warsaw Ghetto, but by positioning their heroic resistance and tragic death alongside those of uh, the victims of Lidis, Katrada retains some elements of the Soviet narrative of the war, but abandons others in order to reflect on the struggle in South Africa. Katrada testified that his visit to the Auschwitz concentration camp was an experience that made an indelible impression on him. And it is important to know that in, in 1947, the Polish government declared Auschwitz-Birkenau a memorial site at which Poles and citizens of other nationalities fought and died a martyr's death. The International Auschwitz Committee, comprised of survivors and relatives of victims, uh, was dominated by veterans of the largely communist uh, Auschwitz underground. And this committee dedicated uh, uh, the barracks uh, in the original war camp uh, to 20 countries for use as national pavilions. Uh, one of these structures became a Jewish pavilion uh, that was usually locked and open only on special occasions. And Auschwitz was exhibited as a site of the Nazi terror and international uh, martyrdom. Um, uh, uh, however, it was not depicted as a Jewish 
uh, side. And as the Jewish extermination was forced into the background, the extent of Polish suffering, as well as the role of the heroic liberating Red Army was foregrounded. And Katrata writes on Auschwitz, and I quote, I could never obliterate the sites of the trench in which dogs mauled and savaged people to death, the gas chambers, the incinerators, the, lamp, the lampshades made of human skin, the pillows stuffed with human hair. He found Auschwitz to be a poignant reminder to mankind of the evils of racism and was overcome with emotion as he walked on uh, the fragments of human bone littering the street near the incinerators. He thought I believed that the Jewish genocide constituted an important lesson for humanity and bore particular relevance for his own country, that he carefully collected a handful of bone fragments, bringing them back to South Africa to serve as a stark reminder of racism's consequences. In an ironic twist, the South African police discovered these bones during a raid on Patrada's flat a few years later, when Katwada explained their prominent provenance, uh, one of the policemen uh, uh, remarked that they were probably just Jews. Although Katwada wrote his memoirs decades after his European Odyssey, his description of these experiences in 1951 remains deeply emotional. Collecting bones of fragments from Auschwitz, this reminder of the consequences of racism, brought home to Katrada the parallels between the Holocaust and possible future consequences of apartheid in South Africa. Katrada returned to South Africa in May 1952, determined to participate actively in the struggle against apartheid. On a winter morning in September 1952, he stood on the podium at the trade hall in Johannesburg, holding a bottle full of human bones he had collected in Auschwitz and addressed the audience of the African National Congress Youth League. And he stated, and I quote, people are fighting for freedom in the whole world. I was in Europe a few months ago and there saw a number of human bones laying about the country, bones of Jews that Hitler killed because he accused them of being communists. They were not communists. Malani is now following the example of Hitler by arresting our leaders." End of quote. This speech delivered only a few months after Katwada's return from Europe provides an accurate and cont uh, a contemporaneous uh, indication of uh, his perception of the Holocaust. On the one hand, he specifically refers to the Jews as Hitler's victim. Simultaneously, however, in noting that Hitler accused the Jews of being communists, Katrada departs from the Jewish narrative of the Holocaust. While the Jewish narrative places anti-Semitism at the center of the Nazi ideology, Katrada's observation implies that Nazi ideology was motivated by anti-communism, a position more com uh, compatible with the Soviet narrative of the war. Moreover, by stating that the Jews were not communists. Katrada emphasizes that Hitler's Nazism enlisted communism as a means for the elimination of the Jewish people during the Holocaust. As we shall see below uh, in other addresses made by Katrada uh, during uh, the 50s, um, this accusation enabled him to draw parallels between Hitler and Malan's policy of invoking the struggle against communism in order to suppress its, op its uh, uh, opposition. And of course, in an address uh, he made to the Anti-Permit Committee on November 18, 1956, he continued to draw connections between Hitler and Malan's anti-communist agenda. And he stated, and I quote, I said to you before that Dr. Malan try to imp imprison our leaders under the Suppression of Communism Act. In 1933, Hitler also had the Suppression of Communism Act in Germany. It was an act to suppress communism. It was an act which killed millions and millions of innocent people who fought for freedom. And in this statement, Katrada repeats his claim that the Third Reich's suppression of Communism Act was Hitler's means 
of executing millions of people. He neglects to uh, designate the victims specifically Jewish identity. Uh, however, he, his comparison between uh, the Nazi Enabling Act of March 1933, which allowed the Nazis to effectively determine who was an opponent, and the apartheid suppression of communism act of 1950 is not inaccurate according to stati statistics held by the nazis the most common uh, form of opposition to nazism came from those ideologically opposed to nazism uh, pr primarily the communists and socialists as in the south african case once one was labeled as an uh, opponent of the government arrest was inevitable. In October 1989, as I stated, uh, just uh, after Petrada was released from prison, he delivered uh, a public speech uh, at uh, Soccer City, uh, where he noted, and I quote, in 1962, in my last public speech before uh, being placed under house arrest, and subsequently sentenced in the Rivonia trial, I showed to the gathering uh, uh, of uh, Wits uh, University students a handful of bones that I had brought back from the Auschwitz concentration camp in Poland. Uh, these were uh, remains of human beings, innocent Jewish uh, people who had been gassed to death uh, for the mere fact that they were Jews. Their bodies were burnt in incinerators and the bones were uh, thrown on the streets of the camp. I brought back these bones as a constant, uh, constant reminder to myself and to my fellow South Africans of the evils of racialism, which dominated uh, every aspect of South African life. As this speech demonstrates, Katrada perceived the human bones brought to South Africa from Auschwitz as bones of innocent Jews who had been gassed to death for the mere fact that they were Jews. This bone serves uh, as a material reminder of the horrors of the Jewish genocide. The speech serves as yet another in indicator of Katrada's embracing of the Jewish tragedy in an effort to promote non-racialism in South Africa. That Katwara's European Odyssey in 1951 clearly influenced his early struggle against apartheid, it is safe to assume that those early insights also steeped into his experiences and continued struggle on Robben Island, and particularly into his deeply personal reading of the diary of Anne Frank, which unfortunately I won't be able to speak about today. I would like to thank you all for listening. And please stay safe and healthy. Thank you. Thank you, Ronnie. Um, thank you for that wonderful exposition and thanks for the research and the two papers that you've written. We have shared that uh, and, and I'm sure at a later occasion, we will probably be asking you to come and spend a bit more time and dealing with both papers in much more detail. This year being the centenary of the, the, the Communist Party, uh, we thought it important to invite the Communist Party to come and talk about Kathrada uh, and, and his relationships and links and membership of the party itself. Um, and it's always important to bear in mind that when Kathy was, uh, was arrested at, at Lily's Leaf, he was there as a full-time organizer or functionary, as he called it, of the Communist Party. Uh, it's safe to say that he only became a signed up member of the ANC uh, after he, he, he was released, although he was sentenced as part of an ANC core of people in the Ravonia trial. Uh, but to reflect on, on Kathy and the Communist Party in the year of its centenary, the party has asked uh, Ronnie Kessels to speak on, e on, on its behalf today. And it's always a pleasure to have Ronnie here, who needs no introduction from me. Comrade Ronnie, over to you. The next 10 minutes is yours. OK, 
Can we get uh, Ronnie Kesdorf? Uh, yeah. Okay, there you are. So, uh, thanks very much. Um, for You're not too clear. We can't hear you too clearly. <laughs> yeah, okay. Now you can hear me. Yes, yes. Well, um, it's a pleasure to be with you. And uh, I bring to this event the um, greetings from the South African Communist Party. Um, of course, in its centenary. And uh, Comrade Cathy was born simply a eight years after the party's foundation. It puts him in touching, touching distance of the founders of the Communist Party. And uh, given his closeness and then membership of the ANC, we're talking of a giant of our struggle who was born just 27 years after the ANC was founded. I think there's something to reflect on this because of the proximity of Cathy, who was actually a younger man than the Mandelas and the Susulus, a good decade older than him. He was really one of that 18, a very modest comrade and human being, talked about an A-team as though he didn't belong to it. We heard this in the lovely video uh, that Anand Singh has produced. So Ahmed Kathrada has those roots and the links with both objective conditions in South Africa, that's the socio-economic, cultural, material, psychological basis of our country, its power relationships, its colonialism, um, the dual oppression, as we thought then, it's actually treble of race and class and, of course, gender. Um, the race factor is very important. As, as I was listening to the previous speaker, the first time I met Comrade Cathy, um, informally, we weren't introduced as Communist Party members. I was just a couple of years into my 20s, and he was in Durban. I had been recruited into the Communist Party and into NK. I'm talking here about 1962. And my mentor and the person who recruited me was MP Nika, great friend of Comrade Cathy's, and of course, the leading communist in the then Natal. I'd been fired from work with Lever Brothers. Um, I'd been arrested there and dragged off to the Transcar to face a trial. I was out on bail and I was fired and uh, doing a bit of work with MP. And there was a little bit of a problem because the party unit that I was in um, it had a very dominant, rather iconic um, member of the party who had been in the party for a long time. And it is coming somewhat of a Maoist, which was confusing me, but I could confide in Comrade MP. And I was really taken up with what was being preached that our movement needed to come out on class issues, on um, anti-imperialism, much more vociferously. And um, MP took advantage of the fact that Comrade Cathy, who was regarded, by the way, as one of the most radical people in the movement, um, was down in KZN or Natal, and they were going to take a tour of the province for a week, meeting various figureheads, Harry Gwala, Comrade Matana and, and so on from Maritzburg to Ladysmith and, and other places up the coast. And MP said to me, I want you to come along. It's giving you a chance to engage with Kathrada. And um, I also want to introduce you around to people in the province who are connected with us as a movement and who we raise funds from. It was clear that Kathy was also out to raise funds uh, for the movement as such. What I want to say is that I had the privilege, and we're talking about Kathrada in 1962. He's not that old. I'm 22, and he's something like, what would have that been, 34 or so. 
Um, here is the guy I was told was an, an, a radical. And, you know, he came across the way we know Kathy and the way we've seen him in the video today. Very sober, very balanced, uh, level-headed, and a person who was sitting in the front of the vehicle with MP and I was in the back, they interacted. He gave a lot of time to me. I want to say to the previous speaker, one of the first things he said to me was, oh, you must be Jewish. <laughs> and, um, you know, I was anti-religion and so on. And I said, yes, and where are your folks from? I told him Lithuania. And he began to tell me, about the suffering, what the Holocaust was, I knew about it in broad brushstrokes, but not to the way that he conveyed it. And then he said to me, look, as a Jew, and, I, and, and you've clearly become involved in the, the liberation movement, South Africa is your country, don't ever think that it was only Jews who perished in that Holocaust, it was Christians, it was socialists, it was communists, it was Roma people, we used the term gypsy in those days, homosexuals and so on. He wanted me to understand that. What I want to say to you, Comrade Sean, and it comes to the party and its role, that what he discussed with me, because MP had clearly briefed him on some of the contradictions in my party unit and some of the questions I was raising. And what he did was give a really very balanced analysis of what the Communist Party had pioneered. The, the characterization of South Africa as colonialism of special type. The fact of the struggle against racial domination for national liberation side by side with the emancipation of labor and the question of woman was dealt with, and I wouldn't say as deeply as later, but he showed a sensitivity. And comrade Sophie, I want to tell you, he told me about the march of the woman um, in 50, 57, and um, he made it clear to me and this comes out in Annette's presentation of really the fact that we had to unite the country in a broad-based way in terms of class, in terms of race, in terms of religion, in terms of gender. And this was a communist speaking. It made a huge impression on me. It was unique because that was the longest period in time that I ever had the privilege of being with Comrade Kathy. It was a whole week. We slept in the, under the same roof during that, that week around the province. And of course, this wasn't the way things were post 1990 and so on, where we met on a perfunctory basis. So Comrade Chan, I've got a clock here and I see I'm just hitting 10 minutes. I, I want to end by saying in terms of the Communist Party and the way we're viewing things and how Comrade Kathy, who is very much alive in our mind, our memory on video film and so on, and in his writings, how would he have been looking at the recent turmoil that has been faced in our country and how it should be dealt with? He would be absolutely, as we are, as outraged. I think he would have been a bit more outraged about the Zuma years than he was in Anand's interview on video, which after all, I think Anand, that must have been about 2014. And there was a need for somewhat discretion then. Things became much worse then after that. And of course, in terms of what was unleashed recently by the acolytes and the grouping around Zuma, the demagogy, the racism, we see what's happening in KZN at present. And the fact that there was clearly an attempt to destabilize the country, he would be absolutely um, strong in the denunciation. He would be calling for exposure, for a dealing with those people who instigated this violence. And further, 
he would be reminding us, comrade uh, Nishan and, and comrades there today, that the kindling, the combustibility for the fire that broke loose, that these opportunists were able to use was the fact that 20, um, de two decades plus since freedom, we still have this enormous gap and gulf between wealth and poverty, the unemployment, the frustration, all the problems of our economy, which if we are going to prevent this kind of outbreak in future, we have to deal firmly with such demagogues and incendiarists. But we have to turn a corner in terms of our economy and find a different approach, one in which we keep strictly on terms with the unity with an ANC, with as the party has made clear in its recent statement, the rejuvenation of the ANC, the saving of the alliance, the dealing with the corruption, the getting us back on track for the values of Cathy, of Ahmed Kathrada and his fellows, men and women, of his golden age. This is the legacy, comrades. This is what we must understand you, and reflect on. So that's the message. And thank you very much for having us present. Long live Lovely. the memory of comrade Cathy. Always great to have you, comrade Ronnie. Um, 2013, uh, saw Ahmed Kathrada going to Palestine <laughs> for the first and only time in his life. Uh, but he went there at, at the invitation of the following speaker, uh, Majid Bamia. Majid is the political coordinator, legal advisor, and the first counselor at the mission of the state of Palestine to the UN. He's a diplomat there. And, and Majid will talk about what transpired from that visit and subsequent to it. Majid, over to you. The next 10 minutes is yours. Thank you, dear Chan, and thank you and to the Kathada Foundation for this invitation to speak of one of my personal heroes and a great friend to Palestine. And you know the ties between Palestine and South Africa and our peoples have been forged and struggled. These are the closest and strongest ties that you can forge. And we did not forget about you while our struggle was ongoing, and you did not forget about us once you had overcome. And uh, Ahmed Katrada, Uncle Kathy embodied that uh, strong and historic and continuous bond uh, between our peoples. Uh, you know, all oppressors uh, want to demonize the struggle of the oppressed. And one of the ways to do that is to demonize the prisoners. Maybe the best way to do that is to demonize the prisoners and to blame the victim for uh, its own fate and to blame us for being under oppression. And so, you know, we've had endured that campaign for years and, and decades uh, across the world, and we were fighting back. Uh, and we had very successful campaigns, but that were about fragmented issues, administrative prisoners, one of the worst forms of arbitrary detention, women prisoners, children prisoners, members of parliament. At some point, we had 40% of our parliamentarians in prison, and there was a running joke that soon we would have the quorum uh, inside Israeli jails. And the reflection that we were having is how can we have a campaign about all prisoners uh, inspired from the Free Mandela campaign. And of course, Marwan Barghouti had a lot of support uh, nationally and internationally. Uh, and, uh, you know, the European Parliament had called for his release, the International Parliamentary Union. And people were saying we should have a Free Marwan Barghouti campaign. And that's it, you know, focusing on, on one figure. And we wanted to, and he wanted also to have all prisoners a call for the release of all prisoners. And people were, in the, especially in the West, skeptical, you know, how difficult and, you know, violence and Israel branding all of these people as terrorists and the backlash. And we knew we could rely on our South African friends because they knew these policies, they knew these practices. You know, when we start explaining, they can finish the sentence for us. And so we asked, who could we invite at a conference that would start these efforts for international campaign and everybody was answering, Ahmed Katrada is the person to do that. Uh, and we invited him and you came along and he was able to see Palestine to interact with the people and 
you know, to show all the things that we've discovered about him, his humanity, his compassion, his solidarity, his leadership. And he stepped up to the plate and he said, you know, we're willing to do anything we can to allow for this campaign for the freedom of Marwan Barghouti and all prisoners, uh, you know, to get the kind of solidarity necessary. And, you know, we understand and he understands that uh, freedom is the condition for peace. And it starts with the freedom of the prisoners uh, to allow for the freedom of a nation. And we've had almost one million prisoners, uh, you know, since the start of the dispossession of the Palestinian people. And therefore, he invited us to Robben Island six months later, and we did what was supposed impossible. We got an international high-level committee and very strong support, uh, former leaders from all continents, now eight to nine Nobel Peace Prize laureates supported the campaign. Uh, we had support from parliaments around the world. And all of that was made possible by just telling people the obvious. If you were for against uh, apartheid and against oppression in South Africa, the same rules apply. If you are for the freedom of Mandela and for the freedom of political prisoners in South Africa, you have to be for the freedom of the Palestinian prisoners. Uh, it, you cannot have these double standards continue. And we believe that that was a winning bet and it wouldn't have been a winning bet without the personal implication of uh, uh, Katrada. And he allowed uh, that to happen. And six months later, we were on Robben Island launching one of the biggest campaign in the history of the struggle of the Palestinian people from the cell of Nelson uh, Mandela, uh, who is a symbol for the entire world. And an icon, uh, Uncle Cathy, was the one launching it uh, alongside Fadwa Barghouti, who was the wife of Marwan Barghouti, and in the presence of civil society organizations from Palestine and leaders and the campaign also enjoyed support from leaders from all political parties in a great sign of, of unity. And what I want to say about that is that we were extremely touched by how, how humble he was about the battles he had fought himself, how interested he was to show support and solidarity uh, with the ones that were coming and speaking of their own ordeal. Uh, and he was shy about speaking about his own suffering and, and sacrifice. And you know, warriors are allowed to rest after having fought long battles like he has done. But there are some warriors, like Katrada, who always ask what battles remain to be fought. And we are privileged that he decided that Palestine was one of these important and emblematic battles in the fight for freedom and justice. And I, I also, if you allow me, you know, uh, it's honorable to fight injustice when you are under its uh, assault. It's even more remarkable when after having done that, you decide to fight injustice that others uh, are enduring. And I can say that we were uh, privileged and lucky to, to walk a few miles alongside a giant who has fought for the freedom of his people and who has fought with the same heart and the same passion and the same interest and the same readiness to do anything we ask for uh, when fighting for the freedom of the Palestinian people. And I think I speak on behalf of the Palestinian people as a whole and our prisoners when I say, uh, our eternal gratitude to him. And he, you know, he's a giant and he asked us to rise up uh, and to rise to the level of the challenges that still lie ahead. Our people are still fighting dispossession, displacement and denial of rights. And we know we can count on your support and on the solidarity of the South African people uh, in succeeding in that battle. He had wrote at the start of this campaign, apartheid after being vanquished in South Africa cannot be allowed to triumph in Palestine, and it shall not, with your support and solidarity and the resilience of our people. And we tell Uncle Cathy he's a Palestinian, we love him, uh, and we wish he, him to rest in peace and in power. Thank you. Thanks, Majid. Uh, thank you so much for that. Um, we're getting towards a, a very important contribution now. Um, Andre Odendal has just released this particular book, uh, amongst others. And in this book, Andre chronicles the establishment of the Robben Island Museum. And what we've asked Andre to talk about here is the establishment of Robben Island Museum, the, the work of Ahmed Kastrada in that, and the issues that emanated from the, the, the establishment and the operationalizing of the museum and, and how some of those issues 
have have be, have, have grown into the issues of capture and corruption that we, we've 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 come to see in South Africa today. So Andre, just thank you for being a chronicler of our history and a storyteller. Um, and over to you uh, for the next twenty minutes. Thanks, Andre. Thank you very much, uh, Sean. And um, also, good afternoon to Barbara, who was uh, shared so much of Kathy's journey to his family and friends and his comrades, and also, especially as you mentioned, to the young leaders and participants of the foundation, who in these times that we're living through must come forward as the leaders for the future. And um, it's a privilege for me to speak about this uh, multidimensional, wonderful person that um, Lakin Kosi um, referred to earlier as multidimensional. Um, and the different aspects of his personality and his interests, his wide range. Um, and I was very fortunate to work with him um, for 10 years. Um, in the setting up of Robben Island, in dealing with legacy work. And it's um, not generally known that uh, from the unbannings in 1990, it was 27 years before Cathy's passing. And in that time, the island and building it into what it should become and what it should represent became a key um, passion in his life and also recording the history of both the island and that magnificent liberation struggle that brought us democracy in 1994. The story, as you've said, is told in our new book, Rainbow Dreams, um, the making of democratic South Africa's first national heritage institution. And I want to also acknowledge my co-editors, Neo um, Lekhotla Lagaramupi, uh, Nal Solani and Kwezi Kampumrana, um, who I think is also on here. Um, and um, we hope that people will look at that fuller story. We can only touch on parts of it. Kathy died on 28th March 2017, aged 89, after seven decades of struggle for the betterment of humanity, I think is is a word that is right if you look at the wide areas of struggle that he was involved in. An activist to the end, um, as his 150 public events for the foundation in 2016 showed. And the program at the funeral, which in itself became a moment of resistance, marking a political turning point in South African politics, listed some of the achievements of this humble or modest man among them, the Freedom of the City Awards of Johannesburg, Cape Town and London, several honorary doctorates and the ANC's highest award, the Isi Twalandwe or Siaparankwe Award, um, or the one who wears the plumes of a rare bird, reserved only for the select few. But one particular line caught my eye, for there listed on the page appeared Appointed as fellow Maibuye Center, University of the Western Cape, 1991. It was something of a shock to me to see that and to think that Kathy counted amongst his life's accomplishment this moment when sitting in an unimpressive empty room at UWC with boxes of unsorted archives around us, uh, he accepted this position with absolutely no benefits. Uh, to join me and Peter Williams and Bertie Fritz um, as the first earlier staff complement of the Maibuya Center. It was such a privilege to work with Kathy, Comrade Kathy, or later simply Uncle Kathy, as this love, much loved man was called. And working with him. Uh, was one of the most profound learning experiences in my life. Not only was he one of those revered Ravonia trialists, he was also generous, modest, highly intelligent individual with a lovely sense of humor and of course an unimpeachable principled approach to life. 
As someone who did not complete school because of politics, he ended up with three degrees in prison. He loved history and recounting stories and reading. He took down notes from all the books he read. And his memoirs and letters from prison remain a testament to his values and contribution to South African society. Part of the reason why he became so obsessed almost with history was the many mistakes that academics and historians like me uh, made in the process of writing about the struggle. He recounted to us the story of how the Ravonia trialists in, once read a piece on the 1960s struggles in which they identified 19 factual errors. And this made for him the telling of the story much more important. So he became an active ambassador for Maibuya. We started from nothing and it ended up being a wonderful archive with energy and dynamism at the time it was founded in, the, in straight after the unbannings. And um, Kathy was so important for us in this. He was always there to talk to. He donated 8,000 pages of material. Um, he helped us collect material from the ANC in exile, which was stored in that famous number 13 Colvard house. And I remember uh, carrying these 13 trunks down into a combi and driving them 1,000 miles to Cape Town with a tremendous sense of privilege. How lucky I was to be observing history, producing history, and participating in small ways in helping to make history during that time. The 90s was a wonderful moment for us. And it was like one could tap uh, and download USB-like living stories of the past when you were with him. Uh, through him, you also met remarkable people like and his most loved friends and comrades like Tata Sisulu and Eddie Daniels, as well as Andimba Toivo Yatoivo, Kwedim Kalipi, and dozens of others. For us, this was a straight pass into the deep heart of the struggle experience. And it was a most amazing learning experience for us. And those people, when you met them, came to personify for me the deep values and universal vision that made the struggle great. Um, so he participated in a whole lot of major things. In 1993, he opened Essie the Robben Island exhibition, which was put in Time magazine. It was a major departure for South African exhibitions done by Maibuye and the South African Museum. Um, he, um, after democracy, um, he was in the president's office and he was elected in February, 1995 at the big reunion of 1000 ex prisoners as chairperson of the ex political prisoners association. Soon after that, he was made head of the future of Robben Island Committee uh, by the cabinet. And he had to report this committee and recommend what should happen to Robben Island in the future. And um, their recommendations were acted on by the cabinet in, um, in September, 1985. The committee took more than 170 submissions in in making it before it made its recommendations. And they uh, varied from the bizarre, like put street children and homeless people on Robben Island as a work camp to business people who wanted opportunities there. Um, um, and even in the past, it was thought that Robben Island should become a kind of sun city. That was never going to happen with Kathy um, in charge of, of uh, working through those proposals. So cabinet took on his recommendation virtually unchanged that Robben Island should be developed as a world heritage site, national monument and national museum, which can become a cultural and conservation showcase for the new South African democracy. While at the same time, maximizing the economic tourism and educational potential of the island. And so that is how um, Robben Island 
we came to be involved, having worked with Kathy in launching Robben Island on the 1st of January, 1997, in record time. Um, it was a moment that, you know, one will remember forever, and it was done in a simple way as well. He's written in his letters and in his many talks, how prisoners miss the voices of children. Um, how um, he first touched a child, I think, after 16 years in prison. And our opening ceremony, throwing open those prison doors after centuries of the place being a place of confinement, was giving the key to an ex-prisoner who'd entered there in chains before to open the doors symbolically with a, with a young child. And that, again, is the influence of Kathy, small things uh, behind very big moments for us and one small step more for democratic South Africa. So at RIM, uh, we basically, it was a lofty goal um, to nurture creativity and innovation, contribute to socioeconomic development and the transformation of South African society and the enrichment of humanity. These soaring goals summed up the spirit of those times. And one of the four core essences, besides maintaining the island's symbolism and heritage and keeping it sustainable, was to make Robben Island a platform for critical debate and lifelong learning. And that again is something that we found with Kathy in his many years in prison. And working Esikritini during one of the most dramatic moments of the 20th century, not just for South Africa, was truly something that impacted on all our lives. Um, our goal was to turn a site with a history of indescribable pain into a place of hope for humanity, to open up this closed environment, also figuratively in the sense of minds, to turn it into a place of learning and education, healing and meaning, a place of universalism and inclusivity, that journey to Prague that we've heard about, no doubt contributed to that. And his goal for the island, his quote about what should happen to the island became the anchor on which the brand was built. If I were to sum up in a sentence our years in prison, I would say, while we not, will not forget the brutality of apartheid, we will not want Robben Island to be a monument of our hardship and suffering. We would want it to be a moment, a monument reflecting the triumph of the human spirit against the forces of evil, a triumph of freedom and human dignity over repression and humiliation, a triumph of wisdom and largeness of spirit against small minds and pettiness, a triumph of courage and determination over human frailty and weakness, a triumph of non-racialism over bigotry and intolerance, a, triumph, a triumph, triumph of the new South Africa over the old. There was that broad inclusiveness, that universalism again. And um, we had a wonderful time starting a whole range of programs on Robben Island. And at the core of these were educational programs. Um, uh, for school children. Our first big sponsorship of three million was so that we could bring children on subsidized tours. One third of the visitors in the first few months were children already right from the start. Joint projects with um, cultural workers and, and writers and artists. Within three months, we had 40 artists in residence living on Robben Island. Joint projects with community groups, including groups working with children. So street children came to Robben Island, but not to do hard labor and be punished, but to draw art and be, uh, be creative and to um, be healed on the island uh, in work weekend stays. Um, exhibitions, publishing series, cooperation with local universities, training programs to fast track a new generation of heritage workers in a three million rand uh, heritage training program done with UCT and UWC, the first of its kind, and linkages with relevant international institutions and programs. And so this was the kind of 
um, energy and the kind of institution we try to set up. Um, it was at a time when it wasn't work for us. We believed everything was possible. And um, it was a kind of attitude of Ungardin, Wan Angom, so don't get tired even tomorrow. It was our date with destiny, and it was driven by the passions, energies, and visions of the time and the struggle and the wisdom of people like Kathy who stood behind it. So we, in no time, um, had a Robin Island Heritage uh, Memories Program. It, it eventually brought uh, 600 uh, prisoners to Robin Island. We built the Nelson Mandela, Mandela Gateway Building in the waterfront as a signature for Robin Island. Kathy collected fully a third of the 45 million that that project cost um, in, in with uh, working with Madiba. We had the Ma National Millennium Celebrations on Robin Island. We incorporated the archives of the Maibuya Center. They were fundamental building blocks for the long-term growth of an institution that were put in place. And unfortunately for us, this magnificent start that we had uh, came to a grinding halt uh, around 2001, 2, 3. Um, and that is uh, what we describe in the book as the Robben Island or the Rim Rupture that happened at that time. And really, um, it, 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 it happened, uh, a, a trigger cause was uh, my management team refusing to bend to pressure for a change in a contract around the ferry uh, in the middle of a seven year period. A change that would have meant the museum was um, was uh, put in a negative, a more negative position and the outsourced partners would make more money from it. Uh, when we uh, did not agree to this, um, all sorts of things started happening on the island. Um, and we started experiencing some of the things that we saw happening uh, in later years um, in state capture. Uh, Telephone tapping, shady office break-ins, home burglaries, uh, improper use of information from stolen computers, bypassing of institutional processes through appeals to higher authorities, in inverted commas, parallel decision-making structures, the dubious presence of intelligence operatives, disinformation planted in the media, threats to life and pressure on key officials to resign or else, all became part of a supposedly high road politics uh, by ex-prisoners to save the island from corruption and mismanagement. Truth and lies, good intentions and behavior, and tactics and pressure that were either questionable, blatantly unethical, or sometimes illegal became mixed up to the detriment of the institution. Politically connected people who proudly described themselves as part of a new patri patriotic bourgeoisie came to the fore, conflating their own interests with the very real needs of former political prisoners, many of whom were in dire financial straits, but whose problems a sympathetic rim was not mandated or resourced to address. So it became you know, this kind of draining, toxic environment that we've seen spread into numerous institutions in the last decade or so. And um, in an attempt to let Robin Island get on with it, I resigned as director in 2002, and, um, but things didn't get better. Uh, the next target became Kathy himself. This icon of the struggle was now in slanderous ways said to have stolen hundreds of millions of rand and was uh, stopping certain people from getting the opportunities that they should from Robben Island given its history. And also a dirty tricks campaign which hurt him tremendously. He eventually stepped down 
as chairperson of the Robben Island Museum Council in, in late 2006, um, feeling battered and disrespected, like many other veterans who openly started referring to the old ANC. Um, he then put his energies, of course, um, and this is why we're sitting here today into the establishment of the Ahmed Katrada Foundation formed in 2008, which um, is still working energetically uh, under our chairperson sitting here today. So really the behavior and tactics, it's not the place to go further into the story Yeah, And we look at the book and how we try to calmly actually itemize what happened. Um, that the behavior, tactics, and pressures on display at Robben Island Museum in that time comprised in a real sense, I think, a pilot case for the factionalism and state capture that increasingly came to characterize South African political life uh, during uh, later presidencies. And it, of course, it's read its head again during the time of the coronavirus under the current administration. The limping museum, because that's what happened to it, it, be, it became injured and has never recovered, in fact, became a precursor of naked political interference and survey, service delivery failures that have today turned several much larger institutions and state-owned enterprises, massive enterprises, into symbols of dysfunctionality. So, RIM itself has really is today in a precarious situation. Some of the tactics that reveal themselves in our time and also under state capture continued under RIM in recent years. And of course, it's no exaggeration to say that hurt further by the dramatic financial impact of the pandemic, the museum is injured and in deep trouble far from being the symbol that Cathy wanted it to be of a new South African energy, culture and values. Uh, so I need to end within uh, three or four minutes. And I think that in our search for answers today, both the museum and the country, we need to look again um, at the founding values that Kathy and others is, uh, is, espoused in our search for answers. Let's look anew again at that generation at a time when they're being subjected to ridicule. Um, a frail Katrada indicated at Mandela's funeral in December 2013 that he was handing over the baton with words that speak clearly to Rim and South Africa's current condition. It is up to the present and next generations to take up the cudgels. It is up to them through service to deepen our democracy, entrench and defend our constitution, eradicate poverty, eliminate inequality, fight corruption, and serve always with compassion, respect, integrity, and tolerance. Above all, they must build our nation and break down the barriers that divide us. Such soft words, such strong truths, spoken in such a simple way. Leadership, humility, and the message of a transcending unity. How could we have given up those incredible values based on the sacrifice and struggles of generations? What Cathy asks us here is to live and implement simple but difficult goals that are radical and transformative. What I read him saying is that to be a disciplined revolutionary today, one has to be a humble, decent person who speaks in positive ways, is open to debate and differences, works hard, delivers, stays accountable, and keeps one focus on the values that matter, including entrenching and defending our constitution. The toughness and discipline of a soldier for freedom are still required. But this time the battle has to be won by being effective in the soft ways of delivery, by checking one's behavior and actions, and by being universal in terms of values and a sense of justice. Far from resorting to a fuzzy moralism stuck in a rainbow past, 
Katrada at 85 remained grounded in a struggle, rooted in basic values which seek to free those in society, imprisoned by poverty, violence and prejudice, with the ultimate goal of uplifting the human condition globally. So, as I've said, he invites us to reconnect to values and struggle dreams again. And the key challenge, of course, Chair, is to reverse the fact that the African people remain largely excluded from so the socioeconomic mainstream in South Africa today. But from pan-Africanists, black consciousness followers, nationalists, liberals, humanists, and people of faith to social democrats, democratic socialists, um, radical social movement activists, um, Marxists and trade union activists committed to constitutionalism, though informed by notions of class struggle, and uh, anti-globalization campaigners. A wide spectrum of Democrats are able to fit Cathy's basic approach into their political frames of reference. And leadership and unity guided by clear values is what is required. I think let me end there and say uh, that let us connect back with our finest traditions of thinking and struggle. And like Mr. K, let us speak up, even at 88 he did it, act and be the agents for the changes our country so desperately needs. Diabulela. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. Um, and I'm hoping that many will, will, will get this book, uh, will, will attend the launches of the book wherever they might be. And at some point we do hope to have, I think just a specific discussion with you on this book, as well as the one that's come out together with Peter Hain on, on, on the sports struggle as well. As we move to closure, two things. One, we want to say thank you and farewell to one of our long serving staff members, Busi Siwe and Kosi. Uh, Busi came to us around 2010, joined us I think formally 2011 onwards, uh, and has been with the foundation for the last 10 years. Today she moves on to another post um, and, and we want to, to, to wish her well as she departs from the anti-racism program that she has so ably managed for the last few years. Um, a formal farewell and, and thank you will, 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 will be done in, in, the, in, the, in the weeks to come. The Katrada Foundation also produced this particular booklet as a training manual um, which we use to train young people on the values of Ahmed Kastrada and, and use it as a basis to get them started on their journey towards activism. If anybody of you are interested, please contact the foundation and, and we can organize these training sessions. As we close, I'm going to ask one of our youth club members from Springs, uh, Zahra Msomi, to just talk to us in the next few minutes what does Uncle, Uncle Kathy mean to me as a young person? Sakra, over to you. Um, and, and once you've done, we would conclude today's proceedings. Thank you. Over to you. All right. Good afternoon to our distinguished guests. I hope I'm audible. Am I audible, Uncle Nishan? Right. Yes, yes. Good afternoon to our distinguished guests, our wonderful presenter and our brilliant audience. My name is Zahara Nusiselelum Somi and as Uncle Nishan mentioned, I am part of the Ahmed Gathrada Youth Club. And I am really honored today to be a part of this discussion and to speak amongst legends and amongst powerful beings that have spoken here today. And I will be eternally grateful for the opportunity that has been provided to me today. I have been asked um, to speak about what does Uncle Kathy mean to me as a young South African? And I remember quite well the first time that I met Uncle, met Uncle Kathy, and it was in the pages of my grade four history textbook, a book that was half my size at the time, but one with incredibly necessary content for youngsters like myself, who had the most fertile mental grounds to plant the seeds of change and of activism in our lives. And over the years, 
Such seeds have been watered and inspired to grow by legends like Uncle Kathy, who have unlocked within ourselves a passion for activism. Um, I am currently 20 years old, and I think that it's quite wonderful to see how Uncle Kathy began his activism at an earlier stage than me, at a very young and tender stage. And the juxtaposition between Uncle Kathy and myself and many youngsters in South Africa today is quite clear. It's that I, this young South African, um, who with a few taps on, uh, uh, who with a few taps on her phone, will have access to unlimited materials that can conscientize me, that can educate me, be it about politics, be it about the law, be it about anything that is socially centered. While on the other hand of the spectrum, Uncle Kathy and his peers and many other young South Africans that lived back then lived in a time where there was deliberate censoring courtesy of the apartheid government, where books such as I Write What I Like by Steve Beagle and books such as The Threefold um, Court by Alex Leguma and multiple other books were banned during their time. And despite such challenges that they faced um, and only having access to a limited number of books, the youth were not defeated nor were they shaken in any way, because as we can see right now, we see them emerging in history as these, um, as the greatest beings who have ever existed in our world. Um, which then leaves me and other young people in this country with the question that if they could do what they could do with the very limited resources that they had, what is it that we could possibly do with the multiple resources that we do have accessible to us? And we can ask ourselves, if they did it, why can't I? Because we are just as human as Uncle Kathy was, with flesh, with blood, and with beating hearts. We are no different from his creation. He too walked, he too talked, he too loved, and he too lived. And since we are all able of doing so, then we are capable of doing so much more and effecting change within our society as well. Uncle Kathy reminds all of us to question and to challenge all systems that disadvantage many and favor a few. He reminds, that, he, he reminds us that even when young, you get to be an impactful human being, that it is in your youth them where you create a version of yourself that will define you for eternity. It is in your youth them where you must begin your legacy and your service must always be for and to the people because in the revolution, there is no space, or there's no place for selfish ambitions, goals and gains. There is always place for change. And we see this from Uncle Kathy that even when he was 25 years old, he was banned from 39 political organizations, even more than his age. And he reminds us that as young people, we need to ensure that we are actively involved in our communities, in our country, in creating the country and creating the world that we so wish to, we so wish to live in. I think another really beautiful thing about Uncle Kathy is that after spending 26 years in prison, he did not put down the weapons that he used to fight against oppressive systems. Still, even in our democracy, he continued to wage war and become an active combatant against systems that disenfranchised the many. And the lesson that we can all draw from how virtue we can all draw from this is how virtuous and principled Uncle Kathy was, um, and how he continued, even in his advanced age, to be rooted in his ethics. And I would now like to read a very important letter that Uncle Kathy wrote um, uh, that he addressed to the youth of South Africa back in 1954 when he was banned. And he says that to the youth of South Africa, the days ahead of us will be dark and there will be many ups and downs in our struggle. It is for these dark days that we must prepare for many a comrade must begin to feel disillusioned, hopeless and helpless. Some will lose confidence in our struggle and fall by the wayside. You must always remember that the cause of freedom is just and invincible, that there's no such thing as defeat. Remember, no struggle in any part of the world was worn in the growing rooms and in conference tables. We must at all times know that as with the struggles of all peoples, the main brunt will have to be borne by the youth. 
We expect you and each and everyone to play your part in whatever you do, sports, social, economic, and cultural. And the ending sentence that he says in this letter is, remember the struggle. For me, this is more than just a letter. It's an affirmation. It's a reminder to the youth of South Africa of then and of now as well to continue in the struggles and fighting injustices that we find ourselves living in today. But most importantly, the voice that I get from this letter is for us to be brave, to be brave. This is what his life says to me and reminds me to be because everything starts with the little effort of being brave. You, an entity that an entity against the sea of injustice requires for you to be brave. You as a human being, as little as, and as little and as small as you think of yourself to be, be brave enough to fight and to unleash all of your might. You might just find that the passion and the love that resides within you is more powerful than any adversity that you have ever faced. So be brave. In conclusion, um, I do not like to think of Uncle Kathy as a lifelong activist because that infers that he has died. Well, I believe that he may have died in flesh, but in spirit, he's still with us. He hasn't died, be, not, he hasn't, for me, he hasn't died, not when I see that there are many of us today who emulate his life, who embody his values and who continue his legacy. And just like Uncle Ronnie mentioned earlier on, um, uh, he's very much alive in all of us. And today I got to meet Uncle Kathy again, and it was beautiful. So thank you so much to everyone's contributions in helping us today learn more about a man who, learn more about a man who should never just remain in the archives of history, but should continue living within all of us today. Thank you very much. Zara, thank you so much. A powerful closure. Greetings to everybody. Um, and we hope to see you soon, as soon as we can organize the first public event of the foundation. I'm sure that all of you will be there. So thank you once more for joining us. Thanks to the SABC and others for flighting this live. And thanks to the friends of the foundation from different parts of the world who've also joined in here today. Please be safe, COVID is still with us. But as I think Zara has indicated, there is a lot of work still to be done. Thank you, be safe. Bye.